Lord God, as you spoke long ago through the voices of your prophets, speak to us here. Oops, thank you. Speak to us here. Speak to us now through the power of your spirit in the words from the story of Luke. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. On the next day, when they'd come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. But they didn't understand the saying. Its meaning was concealed from them, so they could not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart always be acceptable to you, my Lord and my God. <clears throat> Yesterday, some of us witnessed, experienced, not a transfiguration, rather a transformation. The finale of over a year's contemplation and work on the part of our diocese and several months of prayer reflection and interaction of the diocesan selection committee with our newly consecrated Bishop John, Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler. Yesterday was a holy day, a day of blessing, a day of love leading up to our feast day today, the feast of the transfiguration. One morning, Jesus called Peter to come with him. Then he told James and John, the two brothers and fishermen partners of Peter, to come also. Jesus, having knowledge that a happening, not of this ordinary world, would occur, led them up a mountain to pray with him. While they were praying, the apostles looked up toward the sky and became alarmed. They stared at their master and realized something strange utterly unworldly was occurring. The appearance of Jesus' face changed. His clothes became so white, it seemed as though they had been placed, not in a river upon a rock to be rubbed clean, 
but in a very special washing machine with a large dose of Clorox. Blinding white clothing, Peterson tells us in the message. Two elderly men came along and started speaking to Jesus. Peter, James, and John quickly surmised that these elders standing with Jesus were Moses and Elijah. Things were getting stranger by the minute. Moses and Elijah, two paragons of the faith of Israel. Moses was the lawgiver and the leader and Elijah, the great prophet. They discussed Jesus's departure from the world with him, the horrific events that Jesus would complete in Jerusalem, culminating in this prayer to his father, not my will, but thine be done. Even though the apostles struggled to stay awake, tired from climbing the mountain, they watched Jesus in his blinding glory, engaged with Moses and Elijah. Peter, as was his natural bent, became really stirred up. Excitedly, he exclaimed to Jesus, Master, this is a once in a lifetime occasion. Let us build three memorials here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter went babbling on, the apostles found themselves buried in a sun-filled cloud. Intuitively, they knew that God the Father was with them, even though they could not see him. Then suddenly they heard his voice. It was remarkably clear. He spoke directly to the apostles. This is my son, the chosen, listen to him. Listen to him. As suddenly as the cloud had come, it vanished. Moses and Elijah disappeared and Jesus stood alone with Peter, James and John. The apostles overwhelmed did not speak. On the mountain, they saw the kingdom of God present in all its majesty. This extraordinary experience has become known in the Christian church as the Feast of the Transfiguration. God said to the apostles, this is my beloved son, listen to him. That is what we do as we read and reread the gospels. Sometimes we understand what Jesus is asking us to hear and sometimes we do not. Does listening mean what Paul said in a letter to the Philippians, that the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus? Does listening mean trying to understand and acquire his consciousness? The same mind, Paul says. For a long time, the church had put its emphasis on what we know about Jesus, the correct beliefs. We were required to learn these beliefs and agree with them, to relate to Jesus through a series of articles of faith. Belief in Jesus meant acknowledging the virgin birth, the appearance of the Holy Spirit at his baptism, his battle with Satan in the desert, his death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, belief in the Holy Trinity. Not to say these beliefs are unimportant, they are part of our faith, yet in the same mind is about a relationship with Jesus, a close connection of mind and heart with his. In the early church, this teaching of relationship with Jesus was of paramount importance. Far more important than facts or knowledge, the early church's goals were to help us grow into a living, loving relationship with Jesus, to put on the mind of Christ. 
So how do we put on the mind of Christ? How do we listen with his ears? How do we see through his eyes? How do we feel through his heart? How do we learn to respond to this world with his compassion and healing love? That is what Christianity is really all about. It is not nearly so much about right belief. It is about right practice. Jesus came to teach us about right practice. He came as the teacher of non-dual consciousness. Dualistic thinking, on the other hand, is what our culture knows, the us versus them syndrome, each separate from the other. Whereas the non-dual consciousness is a much more holistic approach where one's mind, heart, soul, and senses are receptive to the moment just as it is without any judgment on our part. This concept allows us to accept and love things in themselves and as themselves. It permits us to see ourselves as one with God and with each other. Cynthia Bourgeau, Episcopal priest, writer, and teacher, tells us that non-dualism, quote, requires a shift to an entirely different operating system located in the heart, or better yet, in the mind, in interaction with the heart, end of quote. To this end, Jesus repeatedly uses one phrase, the kingdom of heaven. In the Our Father, we pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Luke, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. In Matthew, he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This kingdom of heaven a glimpse of which we saw in the transfiguration is of foundational importance to what Jesus wants us to hear, to absorb, to experience, to practice. Many Christians believe that the kingdom of heaven means the place we go to when we die. But how can that be? Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is within you that it is here and at hand, that it is now, not later, accessible to us in this moment here on earth. We do not die into it, as many assume, we awaken into it. So where is it then? Jim Marion, author of Putting on the Mind of Christ, suggests that the kingdom of heaven is a metaphor for a state of consciousness. The kingdom of heaven is not a place one goes to. It is a mind and heart set one grows into. The kingdom of heaven is a whole new way of looking at the world, a transformed awareness that literally turns this world upside down. This form of awareness, often referred to as non-dual consciousness, sees no separation, not between God and humans, not between humans and other humans. And these are Jesus's two core teachings underlying everything he says and does. No separation between God and humans. When Jesus talks about this oneness, he speaks about a mutual indwelling. I am in God, God is in you, you are in God, we are in each other. A beautiful symbol for this relationship is found in John's gospel when Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And then a few verses later, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. In other words, 
I am in you and you are in me. Then when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, he speaks of the non-dualistic understanding that your neighbor is in you and you are in your neighbor. No separation. The kingdom of heaven is Jesus's favorite expression for life lived out of a transformed consciousness. It is the world we bring into being when we follow God's command on the mountain. This is my beloved son, listen to him. Listening with a third ear brings about a transfiguration of our consciousness through the power of oneness with Jesus. When attained, we fall into the fullness of God's love. We experience compassion that can only exist without judgment, that can be known only in and through the heart as we live in God's love for us in the kingdom of heaven. Yesterday, we witnessed a transformation, the consecration of Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler as our new Episcopal Bishop of Wyoming. Today on the Feast of the Transfiguration, we celebrate God sharing his beloved son in all his glory with Jesus's beloved apostles. But the transformation and transfiguration are vivid portraits that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As we depart this liturgy, let us live our lives trusting that the kingdom of heaven is within each of us. May we go forth and live life accordingly. Amen.